Hello everyone. Well, a little bit of confusion. Always good when we start. Um, I don't know which microphone is working, but maybe this one. Great. Um, welcome everyone at uh, today's NIAS talk, uh, Secrets of the Sea in Times of Climate Breakdown. Um, I had hoped it would be a little bit more positive, but I hope you can bear uh, with me. My name is Zara Kars. I am tonight's uh, moderator and I am very happy to see you all here at SPUI, but also um, for the people watching online, uh, welcome. Um, a very brief introduction before uh, we go to our speakers. This talk is part of a series of talks called the NIAS Talks. Uh, those are organized every month by the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. That sounds very serious um, and sometimes it is. Um, every year we are a research institute where every year we invite and welcome about 50 researchers, writers, journalists and artists to work on individual and sometimes uh, collaboratory projects um, on a subject or a theme almost always up to their own choice. Um, and during these talks that we organize here every month, we invite our fellows but also alumni to engage with writers, artists, journalists on topics that we deem important and that touch upon public debate. I feel like this microphone is... Oh, it's my earring. I'll remove it. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so here we are, here you are, and tonight we will explore ocean health, climate change or climate crisis, I should say, and uh, new imaginations. And those are three things that might not uh, uh, be very clear how they come together, but I hope that in about an hour and a half or 75 minutes that will be, uh, that will be uh, very clear. We will touch upon the ambiguous nature of marine protection, uh, maybe on the colonial dimensions of ocean health, and we will most definitely uh, look at new imaginations of how we as human beings uh, uh, engage with the sea. Um, it might be me, but often when we talk about the climate crisis, it's about our role as consumers, about global policy making, about the increasing amount of deadly floods or forest fires. But we really rarely talk about um, the world below the surface. Uh, so we thought this would be a fantastic opportunity uh, to do so. Um, and during uh, tonight's talk, we have a number of very fabulous speakers. Um, joining us are Erik Meitz, Geert Bulens, Michael Tedja, Nikki Dekker, Yvonne Koens and Rolando Vasquez. Um, I'll introduce them a bit more uh, later, but now you have an idea. Um, first off, Erik will do a very brief presentation to sort of sketch the landscape or the seascape um, and after his presentation I will join him with Geert here on stage. Michael Tedja will read a poem and uh, during our second panel Yvonne, uh, Nikki and Rolando uh, will uh, discuss or explore those new imaginations of the sea. Um, during each part of this program, feel free to ask questions. Um, the talk is in English, but if you have any questions and you don't know how to ask them in English, please do so in Dutch. Uh, as you might have noticed, our Dunglish here is quite good, so we should be able to somehow uh, uh, get through. Um, enough uh, by me. Erik. Uh, is a social linguist specialized in development studies. He works at the University of Aruba and he is currently uh, at NIAS for a fellowship together with a number of other uh, 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 researchers working on governance and 
climate change or climate crisis and the seas, um, where they really look at marine protected areas. If you don't know what that is, you do so in about 10 minutes, I think. Um, and he will tell us a little bit about his project and the urgency. Give him a warm applause. Thank you for setting the stage uh, and for uh, upping expectations by the audience. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I am indeed part of the theme group Climate Change and the Governance of Tropical Marine Conservation at NIAS. And I'm from the University of Aruba, so I actually come from the Caribbean and I will introduce you to the complexity of the concept of marine protection in times of climate change and the way we as humans actually fail to see through that surface of the ocean to see what the consequences are of our doing and how that actually translates into marine protected areas that are not really what they claim to be and may be challenging uh, the whole concept of marine protection in the light of the 30 by 30 agenda and the 30 by 30 agenda is the international agenda put forward that by 2030, 30% 30 of surface will be, of a marine surface will be protected areas. But it still doesn't make sense if you don't take climate change into account, but also our own behavior and our own economies. And we're studying this in a group of actually seven people. Ivana Kunz is sitting here. Sonny Moonbanan is back there and we share an office at NIAS right now and the picture of the three of us uh, tells you that we work together and we also do this in collaboration with David Close, Siko Visser who are sitting there and uh, Lisa Becking and Lisbeth Bakker of NIO and Wageningen University and of course Kai TLV, KNAW, NIAS, everybody is actually involved in this project. Having said that, we work around marine protected areas in Indonesia here you see two arrows, top one uh, pointing at Bunak and the bottom one at Liase. And uh, in the Caribbean, Aruba and Bonaire. Aruba to the left, Bonaire to the right. And I'm only going to go to the Caribbean right now, just to give you an introduction to some challenges that you face when looking at marine protected areas. You see here those three islands, Aruba, Curaçao, Bonaire. I don't know whether you've ever been there, but they are part of the uh, world biodiversity hot zones, and there's a reason for that. On land, biodiversity is not that high, but quite unique. But then you put your head in the ocean, and you see a wild abundance of ocean biodiversity that's depicted in the nice uh, clubbed finger coral and all the surrounding other kinds of coral. Uh, in the right hand side picture and then you think like okay this is some kind of richness that needs to be protected but there's more to it than that because it's not only that biodiversity richness but also the sheer volume of the ocean and as an ecosystem that is absorbing carbon and that actually is a huge sink of carbon in this uh, planetary ecosystem. Um, and that's why one of the reasons why we're looking at what role does marine protection play in also climate change and what role does climate change play in marine protection. Now, just one thing to think about is that we're talking about a 30 by 30, 30% 30 of surface. But when you come to think of it, the whole surface of the North Sea that is part of the economic zone of the economic exclusion zone of the Netherlands is about the same size of the waters of Aruba, Curaçao and Bonaire together. But that surface when you look at three dimensions, it's only 30 meters deep by on average. Whereas if you go and look in the Caribbean, you immediately go to 800 meters of depth. And that tells you that the volume of water is a multitude of actually the volume of water that the North Sea represents. So those small islands actually harbor vast oceans. In 1979, the marine protected area of Bonaire was established. And it's a very small marine protected area, only 27 square kilometers. And it is the protected area in which sea anemones, all kinds of corals, etc., are being safeguarded from our human intervention. At least, that was the intention. In the 1990s, a study was done measuring that about 4,000 up to 6,000 dive tourists per dive site would be a tolerable number. If you go there today, that is 
the number you get like in 10 days on one dive site. And on the right hand side you see what a coastline looks like. It's very, it's a cliff and immediately when you get into the water you see the corals. Even in this picture you see that. But Bonaire, of course, is a modern island uh, territory and it needs to develop. So development, that means more hotels, apparently. And in the plans for hotels, for tourists, you need to have beaches. But if you look at those beaches and that shoreline, you see that there's a divide between that. That shoreline doesn't fit the beach. So you create a beach over the coral reefs with which you make promotion for your own island territory. So if you go to the airport in Bonaire, you see the marketing with all those nice beaches and the nice coral reefs, but they exclude each other. Even more, in putting the beach over there, you create some kind of runoff that spills over all the coral reefs and will kill the coral reefs. That's not taking into account what our human presence does to these coral reefs. So that economic development does not go hand in hand with marine protection, but actually excludes marine protection. And that leads to the question, can we look below that surface? And now you see two really wonderful pictures taken in Aruba. I took them myself and everybody's always like, wow, that's so beautiful. But on the left hand picture top, you see dead coral. And on the right hand picture, you see invasive species, both signs of weakened ecosystems, weakened by climate change, but also by our human activity. And in the next four minutes, I'll introduce you to that concept. So Aruba also has a marine protected area. So this is what people think about when you think about tourism, of course, right? Uh, you've got the white beaches, pictured by Tobia de Shishalo, and you've got the pelicans that are fishing in the ocean with an abundance of fish, pictured by Joost Boerman. But then you start marine protection. And here you see the areas that have been indicated as marine protected areas for Aruba. Interesting to see is that one of the areas, the most to the left, is actually opened up in the middle to allow cruise ships to come in and out. Just so you know. And there you go. These areas that you just saw, some of them are actually prone to a lot of wastewater contamination. Wastewater, which is the runoff of what we as humans produce after we have eaten stuff in hotels, digested it and gone to the bathroom. And it all ends up in this kind of facilities, which are wastewater treatment facilities. And when heavy rainfalls come, due to climate change actually in the past uh, year, then these facilities are starting to overflow. And what you get is that they need to be opened up to uh, just flooding into the ocean, having debilitating effects on those coral reefs again. And I just showed you the red areas where you have the most wastewater contamination. And then if you look at this map, you see what is left over of the coral reefs. If you look at the studies from the 1970s, there was like a coral reef cover of about 50, 60, up to 70% in the Caribbean coastlines of Aruba, Curaçao and Bonaire. And it has gone down to about 5% now. And in some areas, there's nothing left. Main area where there's nothing left is the tourism area, where tourists are actually scrambling around a leftover golf ball coral or a mustard hill coral of five centimeters across and they're taking pictures of it because that's what they believe to be the state of corals. Actually, we're made to believe that we're doing sustainable stuff when we're talking about marine protection in this kind of areas. And it always remembers, reminds me of this plastic bag that I took a picture of in the ocean in front of Curaçao, which is supposedly 100% biodegradable. But at the end of the day, it is not. We are made to believe that we're doing the right thing by using this kind of tools. Now, we're not the only ones thinking about this, and there's the Unnatural uh, History of the Sea by Callum Roberts. If you want to get a depression, please read it. I just got out of it. Uh, the Boundless Sea by Abu Lafia, um, Wenzel's um, The Disposition of Nature, and a very nice one by Hessler is The Tidal Actics, Imagining the World Through an Oceanic Worldview, uh, or Imagining the Ocean Through an Oceanic uh, Worldview. And these are 
examples of different ways in which we can try to get a grasp on looking deeper underwater and taking responsibility. And this is just last week, the picture taken by Violetta Lopez, uh, somebody working with me on the connectivity of coral reefs, who stumbled upon this diver who's trying to paint the coral reefs underwater, which is a magic endeavor. I hope it's not too polluting what she's doing, but it's just to call upon you to not only see this kind of structures, and this is that coral, as uh, just the thing of beauty that is being portrayed to be a museum, but also a live organism that is part of the substance of what our life is about when we look at the 21st century and beyond. That was my 10 minutes. Eric, um, uh, take a seat, choose a, uh, a chair. Geert, uh, please join us as well. Um, let me briefly introduce you. Um, thank you, Eric. That was very interesting and insightful and also a little bit depressing. Um, before uh, we start the conversation, Geert, um, you are a... Flemish poet, essayist, columnist, professor of modern Dutch literature at Utrecht University and still a guest professor of D Dutch literature at Stellenbosch University. Um, earlier this year, you wrote a book uh, called Wat we toen al wisten, uh, What we have known, uh, I suppose it translates into, about, uh, in which you reflect on the environmental year of 1972, where the, the Club of Rome wrote a report on the limits of growth, grenzen aan de groei, which was uh, the first UN conference on the environment and other important scientific, political and cultural aspects of global environmental crisis. Um, First of all, for those who didn't read it, um, can you explain a little bit on what you um, write about in the book? And maybe, uh, yeah, I think it's on. And maybe immediately on, reflect a little bit on how, if it does relate to Eric's uh, story. <laughs> I don't want to say presentation. <laughs> sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so the book, roughly, I think it translates in the things we knew in 1972. And it's a very depressing book um, <laughs> because um, almost every aspect of today's environmental crisis discussion was already discussed 50 years ago. Um, I could give long lists of examples. They're all in the book. Um, but let's focus on the oceans, right? Because that's what uh, tonight's uh, seminar uh, is, is all about. And um, ocean pollution was, uh, was, was a major concern uh, 50 years ago. Um, oil spills, specifically um, on the California coast in the late 60s, sparked the modern environmental movement in the United States. So on that level, there is a direct link between the, uh, the, the state of the ocean pollution and the uh, modern uh, environmental movement. So on that level, there is a very clear link. Um, but there's, in the, in, in the book, I, I gave all sorts of, uh, all sorts of examples, uh, but I was looking through my notes and uh, something that is not as such in the book and I just want to read out. Uh, as you mentioned, 1972, it's not only the Limits to Growth uh, Club of Rome uh, report, which is a, a major moment in, in environmental history, but maybe even more important um, in 1972 was the uh, first environmental uh, United Nations uh, convention in Stockholm. So that was the first time that the nations of the world came together under the United Nations umbrella to think about environmental policy. Uh, and many of the discussions we are having uh, today, I mean, in these days uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Biodiversity uh, COP in Canada, uh, previous month, the, bio, the uh, uh, COP27, 
uh, in Egypt. Um, the the real crisis in these in both these cops uh, is about um, global north versus global south divisions, um, and that was also the case in 1972. Um, and so the nations of the world came together, but also oh, there were readings, lectures, seminars, all sorts of programs. And in one of these programs, there was a specific presentation on the ocean by uh, a Norwegian explorer. You might have heard of him, uh, Thor Heyerdahl. Um, and so he was... At the beginning of the year, he was asked by the Council of Europe to write a report on the state of the seas in Europe. Uh, specifically, the Mediterranean was uh, horrible uh, at the time. It was just a, a, a dump. Uh, so there were all sorts of uh, environmental scandals at, at the time. Uh, Italian factories dumping uh, gruesome stuff in the Mediterranean. Uh, and so he wrote a report about, uh, about that. And then at the Stockholm uh, conference, he was asked to deliver a talk about the ocean. And I'm just going to quote uh, from, this, uh, from his uh, uh, talk. Uh, it's entitled, A View from a Raft, because he tended to... Uh, use a raft to sail the uh, oceans. It is not only the floating oil clots we should fear the most. Their presence shows us that our planet is not endless and that visible human waste is beginning to bridge world oceans. The oil clots in the sea tell a similar story to that of the refuse on the beach. Visible pollution is seen by some as a symptom of welfare. If you want to bless its presence, however, it should be as an eye-opener. Each empty plastic bottle or tube, each can, each oil clot we see along the roadside or on the beach, should ring a bell and make us think of invisible pollutants already lost in the soil or the sea. Liquids and particles not discernible to the naked eye. Thor Heyerdahl in 1972. Now, the two things that struck me the most during my research are also related to this talk and related to today's topic. Bear with me. In 1972, the scientific journal Science published two separate articles. One, presenting for the first time in history what we, decades later, would call plastic soup. It entered as plastic soup, the Dutch Van Dalen Dictionary in 2011, but it was described in science in 1972. Also in 1972, in science there was an article describing how they dissected fish and found plastic inside of the fish. So two of, let's say, the main discussions we're having today about plastic, plastic soup, and the way it infects everything. Because at the time it was fish, mm. and today it's mother milk, right? I mean, that, that is, let's say, the arc of progress that we have seen over the f uh, five decades uh, since uh, the f these first science articles. So yes, the ocean was a big deal 50 years ago. It was a matter of concern in the Limits to Growth uh, report. Pollution was a major uh, instigator of the environmental movement. Heyerdahl wrote his report, gave this talk, and then we have the two science articles. Then, I mean, maybe this is quite an, an obvious question, but how come it takes so long? I mean, we've known this for 50 years then. Why... Do we not take action, or how come we've this has been sort of what suddering? I don't know if that's English. Yeah, well, the, the uh, thing is, the thing is simmering <laughs> for 50 years. <laughs> In some respects, I think action has been taken, uh, specific, specifically when it comes to um, rivers that have, let's say, that are very clearly uh, in Germany or in France or in the Netherlands. 
lots and lots of environmental regulation has really changed the quality of water in those rivers and improved it. Right? Uh, so on that level, I think action has been taken. Um, the amount of, 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 of waste is only getting, getting worse, that, that right? That is getting worse. Um, and compared to the sea, a river is relatively small, so that, is, that should be manageable, right? Yeah, well, but the thing is, if you read about what people threw in the ocean 50 years ago, right? At the time, it was worse mm. than it is today. I mean, today, we, we of course, we have plastics and, and, and all sorts of, of, of rubbish uh, contaminating the oceans. Um, but at the time, people apparently believed that if you dump stuff deep enough, that it doesn't harm. Mm. Yeah. Right? And so radioact radioactive waste, all sorts of uh, cyanide, I mean, you just name it. Yeah. It was all dumped deep down, yeah. apparently, hoping that would never reach the surface again. Yeah. On that level, I think there has been some improvement. Um, but we're still, of course, yeah. uh, dumping too much and stuff. That, that maybe touches a little bit upon on what you said about the, the volume of the sea and also about, I mean, land is quite flat. Uh, it doesn't move, uh, usually. Um, but seas, they, they move, the oceans, they, they, I mean, water is flowing everywhere. Um, why... Um, can we t can take a different look at, or how can we maybe take that into account in how we look at the sea, this this movement of water, and how we deal with it? Yeah, um, that's that's a very complex question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> but the whole concept of that dynamics of the ocean also plays into the whole idea that people don't take responsibility for it in different ways and i know that my stories are always depressing but i actually want to go to a positive side um, water moves so that also means that when you install a marine protected area or you do conservation the water will come from other places and so you cannot uh, draw a line around it like we do on land. That means that marine protected areas in itself are only an incomplete, insufficient tool when you really want to do something. And that water moving also uh, brings with it that sometimes water literally disappears out of our sight. But if you look at the Pacific at this moment, not a depressing story, but uh, if you look at the west coast in front, coast in front of Oregon, there's only 7% of fish being left over and at this moment you have hypoxic events which means that the water that's coming from below doesn't have oxygen anymore and so even the sea stars and the anemones etc will crawl out of the ocean because they're suffocating in the water now quite recently two years ago the same has happened in bocas del toro which is in the caribbean it just tells us that the impact that we've had on the ocean and uh, dumping underwater and there were barges coming off Florida because they didn't know what to do with waste and they just solved the waste problem of Miami by having barges go out on the ocean and opening uh, the bottom of the boat so that the waste would fall out. That's how we have engaged with the marine environment. And it's my strong belief that uh, the only way for uh, a 30 by 30 agenda to be successful is by really, really starting to understand these impacts. And however depressing that may be, it is the reality of what we've done to those oceans. And I work with oceanographers and marine biologists and marine ecologists from the US and from Europe studying that. But the communities that live in those areas that at this moment are most affected, and you're talking about the north-south divide, they are actually mm -hmm. left out of these conversations. So that's why I really love this project also that we're involved in with uh, the FEM group, where we're also looking at how do the communities themselves deal with these changes and challenges. Because if you don't bring those people on board, and if you don't include them in what this means for their own futures, you're going nowhere. Yeah, so uh, uh, that implies that currently, or at least until maybe recently, those communities have had no say, or practically, practically no say in how to. If if 
If, if I can just refer back to the two examples that I gave, number one is Dutch investors investing in the Caribbean to set up new uh, shareholder profit uh, through hotel industry that does not benefit the society, also not the population that works there because they're also excluded from labor in those hotels. Uh, the situation in our, I, I can tell you more about that. The, the, the situation in Aruba is that the waste production by the hotel and cruise ship industry is all also not benefiting, of course, the, the whole industry, the people that live there, but that new societies are created to work in those industries and to support those industries. And I think awareness of the value system that, that the ocean presents to us, other than monetary benefit and other than it being a boundless place where you can just drop your waste, is extremely important. I see a question with... Can you, can you wait one second, then we'll bring a microphone and then the people at home can also hear your question. Yeah, so I have a question for uh, Eric. You said that economic development uh, excludes marine protection, but is that like the economic development of the north or in this sense the um, not for the communities of the places that are most affected? So could we see marine protection as a way to encourage economic development for those communities? Oh, maybe I'll... <laughs> oh, th thank you for that. Um, it's a complex matter what you're, what, what you're asking here. So marine protection that includes the, the, the societies in which, the communities in which that marine environment is, um, I can see that happening, and, but it needs uh, empowerment of those communities when it comes to the regulation of those marine protected areas and in the economic benefits. But at this moment, the whole construct of uh, creating permits for global northern investors to develop tourism activities in those global southern um, areas does not benefit those communities directly, apart from the fact that some kind of monetary economic development takes place. There is an increased income, there is an increased access to internet and whatsoever. But it will not create a value system that includes the value of those marine ecosystems. So you really have to get there too, which is not easy. I, I, I don't say that I have an answer here. It's just a question we're asking. Mm. Um, uh... You, I think, Geert, you mentioned it, that now for the first time at COP27 in Egypt, oceans were part of, I think, the conversation, or was it Sonny who mentioned it? Oh, I'm saying something completely well, wrong. I, maybe you're referring to the fact that I told you that a second water conference, UN water conference, is coming up in March. The oh, second one in 46 years. It could be as well. I thought... Uh, Sonny yeah. Yeah, exactly, because I was hoping maybe that that, um, that will help, at least for, uh, what, let's say, the next 50 years. We don't have yet another conversation where we say, well, uh, we had no idea what was happening because we didn't uh, act upon those things we didn't necessarily see. Do you see any improvement in that sense? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, um, well, let me say two things. Yes, I do see improvement. Yes, I do see engagement. And yes, I do see a lot more uh, conversation coming up. But at the same time, I see the portrayal of the tourist as the hero that picks up some plastic mm. in one of those marine protected areas and being portrayed in the marketing of that same tourism that destroys these areas. So that whole tourism story within marine protected areas for me is a very complex one. Um, when it comes to, let, let me add one thing here, and it's the role of science, because what, what Heer did with 1972, what we knew back then, um, is really telling the story for a non-science audience. And it made a lot of those stories very accessible to me, for example. I'm a social linguist. What do I know? So I, all of a sudden I could engage with this matter and could engage also with everything that throughout the history of my life actually happened and led up to my understanding of today's climate crisis. But 
At the same time, we also know that 99% of funding that is climate change related goes to the natural sciences. And I'm not against funding the natural sciences, but I do see that if we want to change the agenda of the nations that are in all the nations in the world, then we don't in only have to invest in the natural sciences, but also in people like Geert who tell the story. Now, I don't know whether you got invested in when it comes to writing this book, but the social sciences and humanities need to be funded much more in order to start telling the story and start understanding how people engage with climate change and with marine protection yeah. and the ocean. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I see uh, two quest three questions. Well, we'll try to answer them all in the back. Uh, I'll try to see if I can articulate this. This is primarily to uh, Geert, and I'll try to give a little bit of pushback, because uh, I do research on ecological concerns in soap, and a lot is actually not known. And I'm not saying you are saying you know that we know a lot or anything, <laughs> uh, but if you talk about the plastics that you can see in a fish on a picture or uh, in a lab and that are easy to legislate for, People choose the solid plastics because they can engage with them. Uh, but ecologists I've talked to are only now starting to get concerned about water-soluble plastics. Uh, but the legal framework completely excludes them because we don't know about them. And we don't know about them because we're not interested in them. And we're not interested in them because you can't see it on a le nice little mm -hmm. picture of uh, a fish. So in that sense, the valuing and especially getting concerned about certain types of pollution only is possible after we have a concern or some prior knowing that speaks in a different register. Uh, simultaneously, you say that it has improved a lot what we have thrown in the ocean. Uh, but that also implies that you have some knowledge about some things we throw in the ocean, which you need to say they're bad. Uh, but there's also just a lot of knowledge lacking about the things whether we don't know whether they're bad. All this is to say that also moving this towards a bit of a more positive twist, hopefully. Not to say the positive twists are always good, but uh, clearly knowing is not a good starting point. Even in our valuing of things are better now. Um, but what might you see as a nicer starting point to, to move towards different modes of ordering life. And the same for Eric, if the binary of protected, unprotected is not a good starting point, where do you see more exciting relations for a future organization? Yeah, thank you. Fair point. I mean, I wasn't uh, implying at all that, that we knew everything, right? I mean, I was just saying the, uh, there was some agenda setting on, on all those different uh, elements that are, I think, the, the main discussion points of today's climate crisis. Because um, one of the the things that, that I had no idea about was that most nations in 1972 had no regulations, there were no laws, and they had no data. So that started in 1972. It was actually because of the United Nations setting up this uh, 1972 Stockholm Convention. Uh, every nation of the world was asked to write a report. And, f and for many places in the world, there was the first moment that they started to measure stuff. Right. So most data sets don't go back more than 50 years because mm. people only started to uh, keep data from that moment onwards. Um, and I mean, the, 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 the progress on, on the level of data, of course, is, is huge uh, in, in, these, uh, in these five decades. Um, but of course, there's also lots and lots of stuff we don't know. Now, I forgot a number, but a few months ago, there was a, a chemist on the radio saying how many Chemical, chemical combinations are used in society uh, today. It was a gigantic number. And that only a tiny fraction of it is known to be either safe or unsafe. Mm. And so most of the chemicals we use, we don't even know whether they're unsafe or safe. So there's indeed, I mean, there's lots, and if you say we need uh, more funding for the humanities, yes, of course. <laughs> but I think uh, there's lots of lots of knowledge that we also need to have about chemistry for instance on a very basic level um, 
because what often happens is that new products are introduced. And also in 1972, people introduced the idea that you should only um, market products um, and produce them in the first place if you can guarantee that they are safe. But that is very, very difficult, it's right? And, often and it, short term, isn't yeah, it? Right? And, yeah, and, and often, often indeed it only becomes clear uh, decades later mm. uh, how harmful uh, specific products are. Um, I don't have a solution to that problem. Mm. A brief answer, Eric? As brief as possible. Um, if you look at 1960s and 1970s Boston, you see that Boston Harbor was like this, this, this very polluted area. And the only way it got like uh, to be protected was not by protecting the water surface, but by interventions on the coastline and interventions upriver. And so regulating human behavior rather than only calling places marine protected areas, I think, if, if, if you want a positive input from my side, uh, could, could really be much more successful than only claiming that areas are protected. Mm. Uh, I saw two more questions. Um, let's try to answer them both uh, very briefly because Time is always. Yeah, let's do the first two. <laughs> okay. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've got two examples. Um, uh, I've been in Manila, where there was a very polluted river. Uh, I think it was about eight years ago. The people who were living there were dumping everything there. Why? Because they were poor, they had no income, they, there was nothing where else would they put their waste. They were complained about, then an investment builder bought the river and new villas arose. Those people were just displaced. So did we solve a problem here? That's one. The second is, in the 60s and 70s, um, there were a lot of protests, not only environmentally, but also baas in eigen buik and whatever not. Um, a decade before the AIDS activists um, in, uh, in New York, San Francisco, in how far... Uh, is through which lens we look at things. So is it like an inequality issue? Uh, just like uh, the example you gave with tourism, like you can pick up nice things in marine areas, etc. And um, the second, how far is it time constraints? Were we in the 60s, 70s? Um, we had reason to protest, but were we perhaps unprepared to take it to the next level? And are we prepared now? And from which lens, <laughs> where in society should we put our money on? Beyond science, uh, for scientists it would be great if their science got implemented, right? I don't have an answer to the last uh, thing you said about where we should put, put our money on. But uh, the, the previous thing I think is that's a, that's a really interesting uh, uh, point because the environmentalists of the, of the 60s and 70s um, there's different, different types, uh, but the main impetus, the one you're referring to, let's say the, the countercultural uh, impetus, um, was it tended to be very, very local. And I think on, when you ask, were we prepared? No, because the actual environmental struggle is global. Mm. And the, 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 the real strength of the, of the movement at the time was local. And that's how they were able to change things upstream. Right? And that had great effects. Mm. Um, but the next level is what you're referring to, uh, can only be global. And that's why we have these COPs, but also why they are so difficult. Um, maybe part of the answer. Last question before we move to Michael. Uh, this is also a question to both of the speakers. Um, uh, I was wondering, because this is also, uh, uh, I think, a, a humanities kind of approach you want to uh, want to add to the environmental and biological um, frameworks we are <laughs> dealing with. Um, are there any other uh, value systems that you've come across in your research other than um, like the, the more destructive, let's say, Western value systems that we uh, touched upon now and which are uh, in great extent I think the um, uh, yeah uh, the, the the causes of, of, of the current uh, climate and uh, ocean crisis but 
There's, uh, there's an answer. Definitely. Uh, you come across uh, different value systems there, but there's always this prevalence of the capitalist investment and shareholder value. Um, this is also why you need legal frameworks to, to in, in, in order to be able to, to counterbalance these, these uh, forces. Uh, but talking about value systems, if, if, if you look at uh, what happened in Ecuador, where uh, Pachamama is being included in the constitution, where the value of nature is a constitutional right, in New Zealand, where uh, personhood is attributed to a river uh, in order to be able to, for other people to come up for the uh, values of that river, um, that's one sphere where you can see it. That's constitutional. But you can also go and, 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 and go across the world and talk with people about how they appreciate the natural environment that they live in. And you'll come across so many different value systems that are so much different from just monetizing. I, I always have a, an, an issue with monetizing uh, the value of nature because it immediately tells people that they can pay $1,000 somewhere because they're cutting 10 trees. It doesn't work. So it, 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 it really, we need to find ways to embrace those values in a different way, for sure. Thank you, Eric and uh, Geert. Uh, thank you very much. Um, applause. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, Michael Tedja. He's a writer, an artist, a poet. Um, he often works in series. He is part of the Dutch Academy of Arts and he's currently writer in residence at NIAS, uh, where he works on a family art history, something with Lucibert, if I'm right. Um, and uh, our fellows often have, have uh, seminars where they present their work and then all the other fellows can uh, pitch in and, and give their perspective. And uh, Michael wrote a beautiful poem, either for or during the seminar by Eric, uh, amongst others. And um, I'm very happy that he's here tonight to share his poem again. And it's an extended version, right? Here you go. So, how to study the sea poetically. Uh, when a politician doesn't understand, he becomes frustrated. He wants power. When a poet doesn't understand, he comes alive. The politician thinks he himself is writing a poem for letters are letters, right? The politician is literal, the poet literati. So, describe the open space and place your work in a specific position. A boundary leads the way to communication as emotional complex, be a universal being, but one without a permanently high fever. Move diachronically within a vertically, horizontally or oriented field and read everything from left to right and from top to bottom. You will lose. Everything you experience is new with the world around you, with the world as it will be in the future, the way you see it, create, organize, write about the discourse as a necessary process, be the one that silences thunder and stand tall. God knows with whom you should be angry. Helping the sea is a mental process. When you waylay your life-size head in the sea, you will be recognized. The sea is a place for development and you must tell its story. Don't talk about yourself or about wanting to find a spot for yourself within something that's about to happen. Don't mention your own name. The sea exists outside the personal universe of the scientist. Your work does not exist without the work of others. Up until today, you still know nothing. Think, things are looking good, you see. Your work should provide cross connections between radically different ideas. Do not send announcements to your address. Be aware ideas change after a while. Changes can be applied. Only when you leave yourself, you can enter as new. Your work provides diagonal cross-connections between ostensibly irreconcilable ideas. Politics is the vertical and horizontal space. 
Schizophrenia has nothing to do with the sea. It results from the fact that reality arises out of chaos. We're a mask with delicate character profiles. Your mask is, con is an organic countenance with its own characteristics. It is an expressive translation. Your mask is the external sign of a boundless space. Take a plunge into the craters, the crevices the, that advances the mind. Inventiveness survives hostile surroundings. The greater the pressure, the more dangerous it gets. Never be uncritical. Consciousness is independent of the person you are. It rules with the hammer and governs the superficialities of the person. The sea is humanity. The society of participation will try to lay out paths inside your head, erase them, resist, create culture out of chaos while the sea is arranging things by pointing to things. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think that was a wonderful start for our second panel. Um, I would like to invite Yvonne Koens, uh, Rolando Vasquez and Nikki Decker to join me on stage. Quick inter introductions. Rolando Vasquez is a teacher and a decolonial thinker. His work places the question of the possibility of an ethical life at the core of decolonial thought and he advocates for the decolonial transformation of cultural and educational institutions. Uh, he's currently associate professor of sociology and cluster chair at the University College Utrecht. Welcome. Uh, Nikki, you are a writer and radio maker. Um, your work was published in the in Tirade, the Gids, the Revisor, uh, I hope I say it correctly. Uh, you made a radio, radio documentary and a, you wrote a novel called Deep Deep Blau. I have it in my bag and I forgot to bring it here on stage. Um, where you explore what fish can learn us about love and identity amongst others. It was nominated for the Bronze Uil. Um, welcome. Yvonne uh, is a, a human geographer at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. Uh, you might also know it as the KITLV. Um, you are coordinator of the theme group that Erik is also part of, that really investigates that climate change and governance. Um, I'm very happy that you're all here and I want to start with asking each of you um, what you find intriguing when you think of how we relate to the oceans. Maybe uh, we can start with you, Yvonne. Yes, um, thank you for the introduction and for this question. Um, as has been said, I'm a human geographer and I'm also part of the theme group that Eric introduced to you earlier. And even though it's usually not my role to be the positive one, I guess, <laughs> I feel like I might have to make up for <laughs> what has been said um, so far and to embed a bit um, how I see the topic. As a human geographer, I have been engaging with human environment relations for uh, almost 10 years now. And this is a huge chunk of what human geographers does. That, that's one major field that we engage with. And if I look at my own work, but also um, the, the work of geographers, then we have to admit that most of this work of um, natural resource regulation, um, environmental governance, is focusing on the land. It's on the terrestrial realm. While when it comes to ocean governance, that is a rather new topic within um, this, this bigger field. So maybe <laughs> there is hope that since it is a rather new phenomenon that we are getting somewhere where we do get a better understanding of how to deal with oceans as an environment. And I also think that Michael's uh, poem was very much an invitation to think a bit 
outside the box and to realize that we need new ways to engage with the ocean when we try to think about environmental governance. The unfortunate thing here is <laughs> that we have been hearing about the urgency um, when it comes to dealing with ocean health. Oceans take up and redistribute a lot of heat, they take up CO2, so it's very important that we ensure that these oceans remain healthy and that they um, remain capable of, of taking up these jobs. When we then think about, okay, how is that done, we very um, soon arrive at the point of marine protected areas because they are the area-based tool um, to preserve uh, marine biodiversity, to uh, preserve oceans um, as a habitat. And we have been hearing from Gerd earlier, uh, but also from Eric, about the 30 by 30 push. That is something that is debated at the moment in Montreal at the um, Convention for Biological Diversity. Um, and one of the main outcomes of this um, conference will be this 30 by 30 push, that we want to protect 30% of the ocean by the year 2030. And we should admit that this is something that we are copying from the land, again, where a lot of more research has been done on, to the ocean. And that is, that is actually quite puzzling um, because, and we have been hearing this also um, before today, we are drawing super static borders into a system that is super dynamic. It's swaying. You have been talking about the water moving all the time, but also um, the creatures that inhabit those swaying environments are also very dynamic. And it's only becoming more dynamic if we're adding climate change to the scene. Because those species inhabiting um, the, this area, they are able to move, they're able to migrate. And you might be protecting something and the species within that something that is actually migrating out of your area because it's not appreciating the warming temperatures of the oceans. So I wanted to be positive. Let me <laughs> let me um, <laughs> let me link it back to um, how how we can come up with a more positive way of looking at it. I think that Michael's poem encourages us to do something different, to engage with the with the ocean as an environment in a different way than we have been doing so far, and. A lot of research is coming up that has been introduced by Eric's last slide, looking at the ocean and how we engage with it. And I hope that this research that is coming up here can trigger something that might not be a marine protected area in the end, that might allow us to look into ways of engaging and preserving that is different from just drawing borders into something that is super dynamic. And unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that yet on how to do that, but I am hopeful that by events like the one we're having today, by research that is coming up, that we might get an understanding of how to engage differently and how to embrace um, a very dynamic habitat that we hope to be able to preserve talking about new ways of, of uh, imagining the sea and sea life. Nikki, you wrote Deep Deep Blau. I think most of you here are Dutch, but it translates into Deep Deep Blue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how, uh, what is intriguing for you about the sea? And maybe you can also explain a little bit about what your book is about. Uh, yeah, I will... Is this on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I will just talk about the book because people are always asking me, having written half a, half a novel about the sea, they're always asking me, what do you like about seas? Like, I don't know. I love it. I don't know why you don't love it. Um, and that's probably one of the things I noticed in how people relate to the sea and to fish. Like most people generally do not care. Um, they see the ocean as just a big tub of water and there are some fish in it, they imagine. Like they know about sharks, they know about whales. Um, and then further on, I think most people just go to the beach once or many times in their lives and they stand uh, in the sea with their toes in the sand and they think, well, this must be the rest of it, <laughs> just sand and water. 
Um, whereas it's, yeah, it's a gigantic world filled with all these different species. Um, and what I try to do in the novel is twofold, actually. Half of the novel is a coming of age story about romantic relationships. And the other half is just nonfiction about animals living in the sea. And what connects these two for me is the relationship. Um, so in a, in a romantic relationship, I'm convinced you, you change yourself to fit the image that the other person has of you, right? Especially in the beginning, you fall in love and somebody says to you, oh, I really like the way you move like that. And then you try to do that more and more because you want to um, fit in this box that we put each other in. The same thing is happening with, I'm just going to say fish again, but you can think like corals, anemone anemones. Um, all these different creatures. But if we think of a fish generally as humans, we think of aquariums, we think of food, um, and we do not think intelligent animal that can recognize itself in a mirror, even though the tiniest uh, fish can do that. Uh, we do not think creatures that make art in the sand in order to attract mates. We do not think about fish using tools and all these different things that have been proven in the past one or two decades. It's really, um, um, yeah, knowledge that we didn't have in 1972, I don't think. Um, but what I try to do with the novel, I think, is is also a positive thing in that way that I, there are a few instances where I mention like this animal is dying out, is going extinct, but mostly I really try to impress upon the readers, just readers of literature also, like not readers that are wanting to write an, uh, read an entire book about fish, um, but that they are interesting creatures and that it might be worthwhile to consider not eating them, uh, not uh, killing their environment and I was thinking because I did not make this explicit enough in the novel so I meet a lot of people who come up to me and are like are you a diver as well and I'm like no <laughs> because why would I fly somewhere and then dive in there and disturb the animals that I like like I like to just leave them in peace and maybe watch Blue Planet um, so maybe if there's ever a reprint of the book, then I will add something in the end with a list of books and be like, if you like fish, don't eat them, don't dive. <laughs> Just leave them alone. Um, thank you. Well, I, I, I'm still finishing the book because I, I'm, I'm reading it as we speak. And I think um, you've at least convinced me of not eating fish anymore. So uh, there's one. Um, Rolando. Uh, listening to today's uh, reflections, discussions, um, what do you find intriguing of when you think of how we uh, relate to oceans and maybe sea life uh, more specifically? Um, and maybe adding to that question is, I, I mentioned that you are a decolonial thinker. I don't know if everyone in this room knows exactly what that means. So maybe you can also explain a bit on what you mean with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation and the conversation. Well, I think... Um, I will share very briefly, maybe it will make clear what the coloniality is about with my comments on that add to the conversation. I thought about talking a little bit about the coloniality of the sea and how the sea has been instrumental for colonialism and for the construction of the modern world and how in that exercise of colonialism and power, uh, the Western power, we also made of the sea a uh, social construct that is very distant from other worldviews of the sea or, or oceanic views. Um, so I think first, of course, we know that uh, the transatlantic trade and also the Indian Ocean trade was instrumental for colonialism. And we know that without that conquest of the sea of navigation, we didn't have the possibility of the modern project, of the Eurocentric project of civilization. 
that's one of the main theses of the colonial thought. There is no, uh, there is no Eurocentric Europe, like a Europe that can claim to be at the center of the whole planet, like in our world map, without colonialism. And that colonialism is enabled by, by the conquest of the sea and what I would call thinking of the coloniality of the sea. And of course, well, there are many topics that come through there, but I think that reduction of the sea to a trade route, to the space of navigation for enslavement and then the commodity is very key to to begin drawing a relation to the sea that I would say is bringing us to a condition of oceanlessness. Like I speak a lot about earthlessness, so how the praise of humanity over nature has led us to the climate crisis, to climate collapse. So we are still living in a humanist civilization that is based on that dichotomy where nature is an object of the human and that has led us to earthlessness. And that goes against many other philosophies of the world that we call indigenous or First Nation philosophies, where it's an absurdity to think of oneself as separated from the earth if our whole body is made from earth and the oceans, yeah. right? So how can we think that the conquest of the ocean is making us more powerful and more human? <laughs> it's really an absurdity, right? And in that sense, uh, I don't want to take much time, but one of the questions that is key to the coloniality of the sea is how um, we reduce the sea to this space of crossing as a distance, and we use time as a measure of that distance. Um, so the conquest of distance that destroy actually the relation to the sea mm. or to the ocean. And I think the sea carries, uh, even, even in our Western languages, you have, in Dutch, you have tide, the tide of the sea, the tide of mm. time, right? So the sea was this deep connection to a relational time, to a deep temporality that we have lost with the chronology of progress and infinite growth. And we have lost the idea of the cycle of life. That is what uh, Cecilia Vicuña, this uh, wonderful Chilean artist, said in one of her talks here in Rotterdam, that the problem with plastic is not that it is death, but that is that it cannot die. And the problem of not dying is that you are destroying the cycle or the tide of time, the breath of time, the relation to a time that is memorial. And here I think also in the tradition of the colonial thought, particularly, um, uh, for example, Afrofeminisms and uh, black feminisms, like uh, the work of Jackie Alexander, um, it is very important that the sea becomes a place of memory. You know, it is a place of the Middle Passage, it is a place of memory. Uh, Professor Ramose from South Africa here in the in the library, in the OBA, the Library of Amsterdam, said one, one time when he came to present his book that, uh, that there is hope for justice because the sea doesn't forget. So how can we think of a sea that has memory, that carries the memory of who we are and uh, of our human history, but more than human history as well, instead of a sea that is just a route or that is even worse, a mining site or a place of, uh, or a dump, a waste dump, for example, or a touristic area, right? So how can we go back to the possibility of relating back to the ocean as a place that hosts the possibility of justice for us and for the earth as well? Beautiful. I'd never thought about the sea as as such a thing where you what you as a, a way just to cross distance and, and how indeed in, in Dutch especially the time and the tide uh, play such an important role in how we think about uh, water and crossing it. Um, Yvonne, 
Rolando said, how can we imagine the sea as, as a place of memory? How, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Is this something that you could, within your research, is that um, fertile ground to uh, incorporate? Is this something you think of, what? <laughs> how do you... Um, maybe the, maybe relating it immediately to as a place of memory is a bit difficult to make that direct link, but something that definitely um, comes to mind when I hear you speaking and that links it back again to marine protected areas is that is also to be seen in a um, colonial um, heritage in a way because it was um, again on land but in the early 19th century when um, uh, colonial powers started to exploit um, huge parts of Africa for mining, for agriculture, for, for hunting and then realized oh there is a decline in, in the resources that we would like to exploit and what do we do? Yeah well we pluck areas off and we blame the people who have been living there even before we came and exclude them and then we'll solve the problem. So in, in that sense it definitely um, triggers thinking but I really like the idea of, of the, the ocean as a place of memory that doesn't forget and that, that might lead us to justice. And here again I would urge us to try to, to think out of the box and not use this static concept that has been brought about by, by colonial powers, but to try to see how people have, have been engaging with the oceans and still are on a daily basis that live with their, with their dynamic environment and to see um, how they find ways of reacting to changes that are brought about um, and maybe to be able to learn from that. There is a lot about... Um, co-producing knowledge or participatory approaches in, in conservation and also in marine conservation. But what if we turn that around and say we don't invite people to um, fixed concepts that were brought by, um, by people with more power and that's not only about the global north or the global south, it's also about scientists who claim to, to have power and to be, or who have power by claiming to be the experts. So how can we make sure um, to not just invite people to concepts that are there already, but to allow ourselves to think, to think um, through concepts that have not been brought there, but that we can learn from people who are engaging on a daily basis with their environments. Mm. This reminds me a bit of a, a few weeks ago, I was at a seminar where someone gave a presentation about the, the need to think in more than human uh, perspectives um, uh, when we think about how the way the, the world is, is organized. Um, um, what happens, you think, Nikki, when, I mean, you wrote this book where you, I suppose you can say you, you work from a more than human almost perspective. I, do you think so? I don't think I can. <laughs> um, and this is one of the problems that I think I'm still very much stuck in. Um, I think there's two ways for, for humans to look at the sea and really appreciate it. And one is where people go like, wow, it's such a mystery. I do not know what it is. I do not know how it functions, but I love it. I am not that kind of person. I really love knowledge and facts, um, which you know, <laughs> reading the book. Um, but that's a very um, colonial way of thinking. It really is like I will travel into this territory. I will name the different things I encounter. I will make a hierarchy out of them, which has the white man on top. <laughs> all the way down to, uh, I don't know, like the Zeefunk or like small algae and stuff. Um, I will look at the world in this and, and I can't escape that. I try to um, use it in order to say, well, the algae might be just as interesting and worthwhile as the white man. Um, but I have not yet found a way to escape it, mm. unfortunately. 
but I keep looking for it. And I was discussing this with my partner this morning because I'm working on a new book um, about disability and time uh, and ecosystems. And um, you, you guys have heard, who does not speak Dutch? Okay, um, so at, at one point during the pandemic, um, there was this columnist and she wrote a column that says that um, elderly people and sick people are just old wood, um, door house, um, and they're going to die anyway. So uh, young, uh, healthy people should not sacrifice their lives for these people who will only die a few months earlier. And I was thinking through this and analyzing all the sentences that she wrote. And then my partner is studying to become like a tree protector. <laughs> Makes him sound like a superhero. He's studying to be a tree protector. Um, so I asked him like, am I mistaken? Or is the, the, the old wood more important for the ecosystem than the young twigs growing and he was like no exact so he started launching into this whole monologue of like what is an ecosystem and what do you need to keep an ecosystem healthy um, and i think this is one of the definitely colonial definitely eurocentric ways of looking at the world where we just look at the tree and we think we're already very involved for finding the tree interesting and a good metaphor whereas really it's about all the fungi. Um, he also told me that if you have one teaspoon of earth, there's more different living beings in there than there are humans on the planet. So, yeah, just, just this is, I think for me, this is the way that scientific knowledge can really bring uh, a new perspective. Yeah, I mean, only well. imagine how, what, what is living within what a few drops of, of water then, right? And how much water there is compared to uh, land. Are there any questions uh, in the room? We'll have to hand one uh, microphone over. Yeah, so um, I was listening to uh, you, Yvonne, and you said about a positive look, and we keep talking about this, um, about marine protected areas being uh, affected by external ocean systems, but I was wondering maybe, I, was, I once heard about this place which was once a shark fishing bay and was completely depleted of life, and they started protecting it, and it's now one of the only places on Earth where biodiversity is actually increasing, and it has like um, uh, it helps to stop the, the the coral from dying. And I was wondering whether we could like maybe look at this reverse effect of marine protected areas having this positive outlook on the rest of the ocean instead of just the negative effect of the ocean on marine protected areas. Mm. Yeah. Um I think we have to admit that if we had a marine biologist on the panel, the debate might sound a bit different after all. Um, they would definitely say, and we have a marine biologist um, on the project, and she keeps on emphasizing that they actually do something positive. They're not very convincing if you look at social and ecological aspects, but if you look at um, fish stock, for example, they might be able to do something positive there. I think the whole message that we want to convey is that a lot of the threats to the ecosystem lie outside of the marine protected areas. And if you just draw borders and exclude human activity, and that's mainly fishing, you don't get to do a lot. And if we think about the cases of Aruba and Bonaire that Eric was talking about, the people who are fishing there, the, the number of people is, is very, very limited. So taking the fish out is not the major threat to the ecosystem there. Of course, at the same time, if you stop fishing, you might have a positive effect, especially if you have uh, spawning areas where, where fish go to reproduce and you um, exclude human activity there, there is a positive effect. But if you then look at the trade-off, what does it mean that you exclude all these people? Why you allow huge tui resorts to be put up at the shore that wash all the sediments into the coral, 
does that then make sense, what we're doing there? So we're not saying MPAs are bullshit per se. <laughs> we're just saying it might be smart to look into more adequate solutions. I think I saw another hand. Yeah. <clears throat> Should I stand up? No, I can just sit. I have a question for uh, uh, Rolando. Thank you for your, your uh, a lot for your country, all of you for the wonderful panel. When I listened to you, I had to think about a children's book. And the children's book is a Dutch uh, children's book, and it's called um, Oosterschelde um, Windkracht 10. It is by a Dutch author who's still alive, uh, Jan Terlouw. He's ancient now. He wrote a lot of books. When I was a child, I devoured all of them. And this children, uh, or this uh, this book is about um, 1953, uh, the, the the biggest um, flooding disaster of the 20th century in the Netherlands, uh, in Zeeland. Um, and it is the event that ga gave rise to the, the Delta Werk, the the massive infrastructural project that closed off uh, Zeeland from the the scene to make sure that it never happened. Now the book is about two generations. It's about the generation of engineers that created this, uh, these projects uh, and thought, of, thought it up. And it's about the generation, their children. Their children who saw the envir environmental impact of this high, there's perhaps no bigger symbol of Dutch high modernism than, than this. Now, um, so the argument of the children was this is, this is uh, destroying ecosystems, uh, especially the Oosterschelde, the river, the Oosterschelde, uh, forever. And they protested against it. And uh, there was this intergenerational conflict. And the book is all about that intergenerational conflict. Now, I tell this, I, 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 I summarize uh, uh, this book not so much because there's a kind of, res there's, I, actually, there is a kind of technical resolution because they came up with this kind of dam that you can then open <laughs> and then uh, you only close it during, well, I don't get into the details, not about that. My, the comment is about the tide meant life for the Oosterschelde, for the generation uh, who lost their relatives in 1953, it meant death. So we have to be, I think, a little bit careful. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm putting it a bit sharp here, but to, to, to romanticize this indigenous living with the tide. Now, now I'm pushing myself a little bit in a, in a, in a position where I don't want to be celebrating uh, Dutch technological uh, innovation because the Dutch do that enough. They don't uh, need another one doing that. Um, but it's a tricky thing, uh, the, the, the politics of uh, tides and knowledge of the tides and experience uh, with the tides in, uh, in, in, in Dutch memory and history. Um, just very <laughs> curious to, to, to see how you would respond to, to that. <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> um, yes, of course, I, there are many things to talk about here. Thank you for the intervention um well for example one of my very dear students uh, lena she lives with a monk and in thailand which is a nomad indigenous group of the sea they're nomads of the sea and their wisdom is incredible in the in ways that they became very famous because they were the only people that were not affected by the big tsunami because in their oral traditions they kept the knowledge of how to read the coming of a tsunami. And they all went up the forest when they saw this happening, but it hasn't happened in many generations. It was just handed down. And their houses are high up to live with the sea. And they live also in boats that now they cannot do. So, so it speaks of a completely different approach to how you relate to the earth and to the sea when you raise up your house so that the sea can come and go, or you build boats, than if you put a dam and you want to control the sea completely, you know, to subdue nature so that you can build up your infrastructure. It's a complete different worldview. That is my point, that it is a different ontology at play, and that we are trying to now move in a decolonial perspective from the single ontology of the West that is based on the nature human dichotomy into pluriversality 
into allowing other forms of living on Earth that now we are seeing are, have a strong responses to the problems we have created with our single ontology. So that is one of the issues. And, and when I was talking about the tide, I was, I mean, I couldn't go deep enough, but it's more a philosophical issue about our relation to time. And that has to do with my work, but it, it has to do with how Western civilization imposed a chronology, a linear temporality that sometimes we say it's circular, but still in this linear representation or this spatial representation of time. And I think what I wanted to recall with how language like Dutch and German have tied as being time and being the tide also in Old English is because we had other notions of time, not as circular, not as linear and progressive, but we have notions of time that had to do with the rhythm of life that coincides with many other philosophies in the world. You know, where the preservation of time is the preservation of our relation to the memorial, to the ancestral, to this deep relation also where the animals are ancestral, where the sea is ancestral. And um, because it is ancestral, meaning it is from before our life, we cannot own it, we cannot reduce it to property in the present. We cannot sell it or destroy it for our own sake because it precedes us and it, it creates an ethical link. And that carries a different notion of time than the time we see of chronology, of consumption, of destruction. That's why I use the, I recall that tide, the tide of time that you can think as the ebb and flow of the sea carries that notion of time that we have lost with our chronology, with our clocks that enable navigation, that enable uh, the capitalist economy to grow, for example. So how can we go back to live with time and not without time, not in the empty present? So part of my work is also criticizing the notion of contemporaneity and this empty present as Walter Benjamin clearly diagnosed. You know, so that's why I recall the word tide when we are speaking about the sea, because it makes us think of a time that is not cyclical in the simple way and not just um, linear or chronological, but it's a deep time that has the depth of the sea. And that's what we have forgotten in our, in my decolonial perspective of Western civilization, we live on a, we live on a place of forgetfulness of the screen time of looking towards futurity, but not of remembering who we are. That is, that's why I brought the tide into the equation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, looking at the time, um, I the think time. <laughs> um, maybe we should uh, make it an end. Um, there are drinks uh, here uh, just around the corner. Um, Thank you for this wonderful contributions. Uh, Michael, Geert, Eric, Yvonne, Rolando, Nikki. Uh, I think the notion of deep time is very interesting and intriguing in reimagining how we deal with the sea in the future. So maybe there is a, a, a sparkle of hope there. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for watching. Um, I hope you stay for a drink. And uh, I also hope that you will join us next year um, in our upcoming NIAS talk on the 18th of January, where we will discuss something completely different, namely how algorithms might help us uh, limit the enormous cues in the psychiatric sector. Um, well, um, thank you all and uh, see you later. <laughs>